So are you credited at, on the records as just JR? There's like six different kinds of credits. John Robinson, John J.R. Robinson, for Big Daddy. I don't even know what the hell that was. That was back in the Quincy days. Welcome to 4-4, where we get in rhythm with our guests by asking four reverent questions and four not-so-reverent questions. Our guest today is John J.R. Robinson. He has played on thousands of hits. Don't stop till you get enough. Higher love. Express yourself. We are the world. J.R., thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Do you have any idea how many songs you've played on? There's thousands, but what we're doing now is, I mean, these numbers aren't complete. What we're doing now is tracking 3,500 titles, just so people know. In America, we're still not getting paid royalties for radio play. We need to figure that out. That will change. So there's probably over 10,000. In the early days of hip hop, there were a lot of people who said like, oh, you can't copyright a beat. That has changed, I believe, in the past maybe 20 years. Do you see royalties from samples? I do, but not nearly enough. There should be some sort of an accounting to that. You know, it's hard to actually rip a bass part off. You know, if you're trying to rip off one of the A cats, they're always masked in a song, but the drummers tend to, you know, have open space now and then. A lot of people think that's theirs for the stealing, and it's not. Our union is not as strong as it used to be, plus there's a lot more variables. For them to pay people to go look for guitar samples or drum samples or Jerry Hay samples, they're out there on every song. This could go back as far as Roger Lynn actually borrowing... <laughs> stealing drum sounds for the LM1. There you go, I just said it. What's your favorite drummer joke? How can you tell if the drum riser's even? Oh. Drool comes out equally out of both sides. <laughs> what non-musical work of art uh, has had the most impact on you? I don't know, I, I guess kind of Monet, is it, what was it, water lilies? A lot of that Monet stuff I've always had. My dad was an optometrist, so dealing with vision problems, and if you look at things without your correctiveness, they tend to look like that. I think it's just really beautiful. I remember uh, hearing something about you, you saying <laughs> some advice that Quincy Jones had given you about symbols. Can you tell me that story? There was one specific session that actually rewrote who I was as a drummer. When I joined Rufus and Chaka Khan in, in 78, you know, I was coming out of Boston thundering and playing 64th notes and thinking, I've learned a whole bunch of stuff. I learned all this stuff on piano and I, and I know everything. And I get into the band and they, they go, don't play that shit, is what, what they basically said. I go, what? I go, I've been studying. I've been, I'm, I'm like, come on, fusion rules. And of course it didn't. We're coming to a Quincy Jones session. It was probably for The Dude, which was just such a great record. We were in uh, Westlake A, had a real low ceiling. We had a first day. And David Williams, by the way, the great guitar player, had already left and joined Madonna. So we ended up getting Lukather, and Lukather became the house guitar player. A lot of people just think of him as a rock guitar player, but he's really so in tune with every kind of music. So we're doing a session on Monday, and everything's cool, and they got gobos around me, and I, I had a, a nice set, a few toms, a few cymbals, nothing, to, you know, not big crap. The next day, I get a, it's a 10 a.m. start, and Lukather, ironically, is there before me, which was just a miracle in itself. And he's laughing at me, and he goes, ha, 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 JR, look at your drums. I go, what are you talking about? They're right there. But I didn't look over the gobos, and I look, and they're all gone. But the bass drum, the snare drum, and the hi-hat. And then Bruce Sweetine, big Bruce, comes in, and he goes, Quincy doesn't want any fills on this record. And I just looked at everybody, and I go, okay. <laughs> What are you going to do? So he took everything away. In other words, if it ain't there, I ain't going to hit it. This is the Quiz 500 from 1979. We're going to just go until you get one wrong. It's all music trivia. Oh, jeez. You might have played on... No, you wouldn't have been playing on any of these in 79. Uh, maybe. Okay. I Write the Songs was a hit for... Barry Manilow? Yep. What type of music do the Brothers Johnson play? Funk. R and B. Yeah, funk. I think it's listed as funk. Let me just check. Hang on. Well, they they did everything. They even went went down the pop category for a moment. So it's listed as R and B. What country okay. star is also a coal miner's daughter? Uh, I was supposed to be in that second movie. What's her name? Roseanne Cash. Close. Loretta Lynn. Of yeah. all of the soundtrack work that you've done, all the songs that you've played on that have been placed in movies, 
Do you have a favorite scene that comes to mind? Up until the new days with Hans Zimmer, he would call me personally and ask me if I were to play with another drummer or two, who would I like to play with? Which was, geez, what a cool question. And I didn't really know how his brain was thinking. And let's revert back to Pirates of the Caribbean 2, where the Kraken came out of the water. You remember that? Yeah. He called me and he was so adamant about, I don't want taiko drums. Every effing composer is using taiko drums. It's just one dimensional blah. He goes, what I want is three drummers to emulate that with snares off. Who do you want to play with? Okay, I got. I want Abe Jr. on my right, and I want Vinny on my left. So we go into Streisand stage, and this is before they were writing the music correctly. It was stupid computer printouts, and it was really hard to read. By the way, I have video of that session that I haven't released yet. I'll release it at the right time. But it shows the three of us playing, struggling, being in unison, rocking and trying to play this original idea from Hans Zimmer. Cut to the last five years, you know, he's released Superman, Batman versus Superman, you know, all this great stuff where he would use 14 drummers at first. And it was interesting because I, I, I insisted about being in the middle so I could see all the other drummers and I'd have Vinny across from me. And then everybody else we plugged in. And then we went into a smaller version of that. And then we went into a semicircle 11 drummer version of that. And all those came out on movies. That was some of the greatest stuff ever. Other movies, First Wives Club. The end of that is Goldie Hawn, Bette Midler, and Diane Keaton singing, uh, You Don't Own Me. The uh, Quincy Jones produced from 63, uh, Leslie Gore. It was a very cool thing. And we're still trying to get credited because on movie soundtracks, it just, it doesn't even give the musicians. That's a slow road. And, you know, hopefully the people at Berkeley or the people that go into administration once they're out can help with that. I think those were all good answers, but I think they're incorrect. Oh, yeah, you go, baby. The best one is uh, Wilson Phillips' Hold On. In Bridesmaids with Maya Rudolph, she even does the air drums. Oh my God, you're, jeez. It's such a good scene. When you play on a session, you do what you're told, but how about when it comes to mixing? Are there any songs that you wish you could remix? Bring the drums up or bring them down? Yeah, probably, um, both. There were songs or people I'd worked with, you know, from Stephen Stills to Glenn Fry. I mean, I worked with Bob Seger, and, and his stuff was always really fat sounding. I've heard certain people after records came out that war it just wasn't fat. Even if you look at Hold On, Glenn Ballard was the producer. You know, there's some machine parts in there, but uh, there was still this lack of low end. It's almost very a Beach Boys focused, where you knew there was some happening low end parts, but you couldn't hear them. I think those drums are great. They're just so. <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah, they're bigger. Yeah, they're, yeah, it's true. I was very fortunate. I played on seven of Whitney's singles and 18 of Michael's or the Jackson singles. You mentioned the number of Michael Jackson things you performed on. Off the Wall is a better record than Thriller. Right? It's not a question. There, it's, it's not even deba debatable. Right. By the way, Bruce and all those engineers, they won for Thriller because they got slapped from off the wall. You had to give it to them. The songs aren't as good. The sequence uh, is not there for sequence, Thriller. It's also analog versus digital. Ah, I didn't know that. So yeah, who plays drums uh, on Thriller? Well, there's rumors that I am. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm, we're gonna leave those at rumors. <laughs> it was, God bless, Indugu played on a, a, a couple of songs. Jeff played on a couple of songs. And the rest of it is programmed. Yeah. And I don't know if I'm sampled or not. John, J.R. Robinson, thank you for joining us. Pat, it was my honor to be a part of my alma mater. And, you know, I had great times when I went to Berkeley in the 70s and learned. And I'm still very close with a lot of people. For all the kids out there, I'd stay behind your passion. Don't, don't lose your passion.